we'd be looking at the standards in the state of Florida to make sure that they are the proper standards and what we should be having and what we should have in the state. Uh, we have made several generations of changes to our standards over the last um, 10 years. I think we had, like I said, we had the Sunshine State standards, then we had the Next Generation standards, Common Core, and now we're on the Florida standards. And as we've changed those standards, we've come through, we've changed the assessment. We do that, I'm not quite sure how frequently, maybe every four years, I believe, four or five years, we come in and, and reevaluate and make sure that we're staying um, on, on mark and continuing to raise the bar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thinking back to when uh, the process was going in place on uh, that decision to implement, uh, were you able to involve parents at all in any hearings, or were you able to be in a position to receive input from parent groups throughout that process? Are you talking when we, way back in the 90s, when we decided to do standards as a whole throughout the state, the Sunshine Standards? Um, we, we've, in, we've involved parents throughout the process in the state of Florida. Um, even in our assessment process, we, when we, we, our prior, the prior test, the one we have now, which was the Florida Comprehensive Assessment Testing, it's called FCAT, um, we, had, you know, we had a committee that comes together of about 30 people who review each of the uh, items on that test to make sure that what we're testing is uh, to the standard and, and looks at the test very, you know, they, they dev develop that test. And if the, the committee is not in agreement of a question, a question gets thrown out. I mean, we, um, we are very inclusive in how we uh, in, include people in the state of Florida in our process. It's not, it's not done um, from just one person. We have a lot of input from our, our districts and from our parents. Uh, also in the state of Florida, the districts have autonomy to, to run their districts. So we you know, do set policy at the state of Florida, but you'll see a lot of diversity from district to district in the way that they um, deal with um, various different, uh, how they do different schools, how they do possibly their budgeting. You know, we have a lot of choice in the state of Florida, which we've worked on, um, which I think is beneficial, but you will see some districts that have way more choice type schools, um, their own district generated magnet, a lot of charter schools in some districts, not so much in others. There's a lot of autonomy among our districts as well. Um, and I strongly support the state's autonomy from the federal government also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how, how is your new assessment going to work? Uh, Florida is well known for, for having the, uh, the grading system, the A to F grading system. How will this new assessment work? Uh, with your state accountability system? Is there going to be a phase-in period, or, or how do you anticipate that rolling out? Um, at this time, we're planning to do it the way we've done all of the other ones as well. We will do the test. We will align it uh, to what we've had in the previous years. Um, and, you know, there's always a dip. When we changed our, um, our FCAT, I think it was FCAT 2, 2.0, I believe, when we changed it the last time, there was a dip in the students um, and the performance on the FCAT, partly because the standards were harder. Um, and partly, I'm assuming from a change in the test, I anticipate we'll have those same things that will happen with this test. But I don't want to, there's been a, a request that we pause and not continue to use the assessment. Um, but I, I, you know, ha having had children in school, and I have one actually that's still in high school now, I, I don't want any, you know, we can take that information and we can use the, the data from the assessment. But I think we need to continue to do the assessment and to make sure that our students are being taught the standards. Our assessments are used for many different things, but mostly to make sure that our students are, in fact, learning the things that are being taught to them. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to open it up again in case any questions have, have come up from those who are, are listening. Um, all right. Uh, I understand that Senator Black should be here uh, soon. Um, Senator, do you have any additional things to add uh, relative to Florida's experience? What what does it? Uh, it sounds like things are are moving right ahead, and um, because you've been able to customize them and and make them Florida's standards. Sure. Um, and, and that's been something that's been very important to us as Floridians. I, uh, I think it's somewhat unfortunate, if you will, that the, that the whole discussion on Common Core standards has gotten to the point that it was um, 
whether it was being uh, taken over more by the federal government or whether that was a perception or if it was a reality, I don't really know. I've, I've always protected Florida's ability to be autonomous with standards. But I, don't, but I do support standards, and I do support having the ability to have a comparison from state to state on similar or same standards. Uh, we, you know, many people have said that you, know, that you don't want to have the state standards and that you know, it needs to be very local. But most of our colleges and universities will look at the ACT and the SAT and how kids performed on those tests. I think it's unfortunate that if you were to look trending wise, there are some states where historically the majority of the kids do not perform very well, and there's other states where the kids perform better. I, it, you know, it could be to the fact that the, the, some of those states may not be teaching things students are needing to know, and it's, you know, that's what the benefit of having common standards. But it definitely needs to be a state-generated optional uh, for state to state to decide if this is something that they want to be a part of. Do they want to be able to compare? Um, from one state to the other. And it also is beneficial for our students that are in military or um, move across the state for whatever reason across the country. We see that happening. It would be you know, beneficial if kids in, in one state are learning similar things to kids in another state. So that was where, the, like I said, the beginning of the whole Common Core conversation came about. Um, unfortunately, it's been people believe that it's a, a way for the government to take over all education. Yeah, I've homeschooled my children. I've had private school, public school. Uh, I think that the, obviously the priority of education should be in the hands of the parent, and there should be a lot of opportunities and choices. And if I don't want to send my child to a public school, private school, charter school, homeschool should be options. Um, government should not be, at the federal level, mandating. But I don't think there's any problem in coming together um, voluntarily as states to decide what we think might be something that states participate in. Uh, that's how it began. I don't know that that's where it is today. And that's why I think you're seeing the pause that you're seeing across the country to make sure that each state has this autonomy, which I absolutely support. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. And, and uh, I, I can only agree. As a mother of five, I have uh, homeschooled. I've had charter. Uh, we've used charter schools. We've done private. And we've done public. And, and I agree that it's important to have those options and for the state to be in control of, of what the standards are at those levels. Um, uh, did you, do you, uh, can you speak to uh, when Florida did make your changes to the standards as a recipient of, of race to the top funds, did you, uh, did you experience any negative consequences from the, uh, from the U.S. Department of Ed um, because of those changes? We, we have not. Um, we've, like I said, we made the 99 changes, I believe was the number, I, if I serve, memory serves me correctly, uh, to the changes. So we have not had any pushback from the, from the Department of Ed on that. I think there was some discussion. I, I guess you cannot change the Common Core standards, but we weren't changing the Common Core standards. We were adopting the Florida standards, um, which had a lot of the Common Core um, uh, and, and just to be clear on what Common Core standards are, I mean, they're standards. It's just, you know, when you learn certain parts and things in math, whether you're required to learn in kindergarten from, to count from 0 to 50 or 0 to 100. I mean, it's, uh, so, so often we get into the conversations and, and people uh, have an impression that these standards are something just completely different from what students have learned. We're not completely putting education on its head. We're just changing um, some of the things that we're requiring kids to learn when. Some of those things may be good, some of those things may be bad, and that's why it's important that the states have their ability to come in and create their own standards based on their population, which is what we did in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Has Senator Black been able to join us? All right. Well, maybe I will just take a few uh, moments here at this point to uh, give a brief update on Idaho. Uh, we went through a similar process uh, to Florida um, beginning back in, uh, uh, well, in, in uh, just shortly after our state superintendent at the time was elected, Superintendent Tom Lee involved in some of those original discussions on the creation of uh, uh, common standards, uh, but uh, from the state. So then in 2010, we began our, uh, uh, well, in 2009, actually, we held regional meetings. And I was serving as a local school board member at the time and remember attending it. Um, 
So uh, that's been one of those things I've been able to say to folks who, who claim there was no public process. You know, as a school board member, I attended. I was, I was interested. I was there. Um, so then we went through our, our uh, typical rules process with the State Department, State Board of Education, and then the, the legislature uh, in January of 2011 did adopt. And we've been in a phased-in implementation. Uh, uh, last year, we, we uh, field tested uh, the Smarter Balanced uh, test. We are in that consortium. And uh, we're taking it. This, this will be our first year of application. Or, or full full rollout of the exam this spring. Uh, we we took some steps during last legislative session um, to address concerns around uh, data privacy as well as um, the assessment creating a public committee to uh, review those comments. And uh, the legislation mandated uh, 30. Uh, members of that committee, but we ended up with 120, and I believe there were, there were a very small amount of questions that were actually kicked out independently um, of, of the exam. So uh, we've gotten a, a better comfort level with that exam. We're, we're still concerned about length of the exam and those sorts of things here. Um, but our standards will be uh, up for automatic review uh, in 2000, the, the 2016 legislative session. And at this point, it looks like uh, we won't see any efforts to repeal uh, this year. Um, and I think we'll just put them through our same, uh, the same process they went through the first time uh, when they were put in place. And we'll have that conversation uh, again next legislative session. Excellent. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Senator Stargell. Um, this is Lindsay Russell again, <coughs> uh, the Task Force Director um, at ALEC. And if you would just give us one minute, Senator Black is running to a phone. He had just left the committee meeting. Um, and he should uh, be joining us here in just a few minutes. Senator Horman, I did just get a question um, via text message, and um, they were wanting to know a little bit more about what Idaho is proposing to do with the student data aspect of um, the legislation this year. We passed, we passed our student uh, data privacy bill in the uh, last year, in the 14 session. Um, and at this point, we have not identified any modifications that need to be made. Uh, we felt like we were able to strike uh, a good balance there. You know, we protected the things you would expect, social security numbers. We don't collect um, those types of things. Um, at this point, that legislation is play in place, and um, no one is coming forward with uh, modifications. Now, we are experiencing some challenges with our longitudinal data system, and we are expecting a report from our Office of Performance Evaluations uh, within the next two weeks on that system. Uh, but that is unrelated to the, the collection piece of what's um, It's more about how it's uh, gathered and assembled. And, um, but that's really... Um, that's really all that's going on around that issue uh, this year is as far as modifications that I am aware of. Senator Stargell, are you ready to Go ahead. I'm sorry? Uh, this is Senator Black. Can you hear me now? Welcome, Senator Black. This is uh, Representative Wendy Horman from Idaho. We're grateful that you to uh, make it to our our webinar today, uh, Senator Black, uh, 
represents a county in Northern Virginia. Um, he's a retired Marine and flew many combat vis uh, missions in Vietnam. In 1994, he retired from military service and uh, to become a partner in a law firm and is a frequent media guest on uh, the national networks discussing foreign and military affairs. Uh, was first elected to the House of Delegates in 1998, and we're thankful that you can be with us today. Well, thank you. I, I'm sorry that uh, I, I was stuck in traffic, so it's taken me a bit. But anyway, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you. If you would like to uh, uh, just talk to us a little bit about uh, Virginia's decision to uh, not participate in Common Core and the path that that has led you on. Yes, we, uh, uh, we adopted something called the Standards of Learning. Uh, we did this back in 1995, and it was a very comprehensive program of establishing standards for the state. Uh, it was done under the, uh, uh, under the uh, supervision of the Board of Education. Tremendous bipartisan effort, and we have put those in place. Uh, and uh, uh, those we, you know, we evaluate the uh, students' uh, achievement of basic standards, and we also mindful of of how the uh, schools are faring. So it's been a very it's been a very successful program in Virginia, and when Common Core uh, attempted to get a hold on Virginia uh, to some extent felt like we had simply had enough of uh, of the uh, you know of you know one layer after the other of standardized testing and so um, we have so far we have not adopted standards of learning And so when the, uh, when the Common Core was beginning to roll out um, and, and various states were making the decision to adopt, can you talk to us about the conversation in Virginia and, and what led you to uh, not adopt? Well, the, the feeling in Virginia, um, we, we knew that the entire nation was being swept by the standards of learning, or rather the uh, Common Core movement, um, I think there was there was some uh, sort of just a feeling that uh, Virginia had uh, had done uh, a superior job in this area, and that we really did not need the federal government to uh, uh, to come in and to you know, take a role in this. Now, uh, the anti-Common Core movement seems to have uh, just exploded all over the nation, and I think, I think to some extent, there is just a, a general vision of uh, federal involvement in the educational process, uh, the dictation of federal standards that would come down from Washington. And uh, so even though we have not adopted uh, the Common Core in Virginia, there, there seems to be a fairly steady outpouring of concern that something might happen and somehow they might, uh, uh, they might be able to get a foothold here. Uh, this really is the, is the reason that I've introduced legislation this year. It's really a, a more of a palliative thing uh, where we don't have Common Core, but uh, I've introduced uh, Senate Bill 724, and the bill would prevent the Board of, Ed, Board of Education from implementing Common Core state standards without the prior approval of the General Assembly. Um, we'll, we'll see where that goes. I, I think the Board of, the Board of Education 
is a little reluctant to have the General Assembly looking over their shoulder on, on anything, but uh, they have told me that they, they have absolutely no intention of adopting Common Core in Virginia with or without the, the uh, bill that I've introduced. Mm -hmm. Well, our Board of Ed here in Idaho must regret the position they're in because they couldn't do it without the blessing of the legislature here. So, <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> can you can you speak at all about your assessments? Uh, I I presume you have a a unique Virginia assessment. Can you address uh, how it might? compared to other assessments that other states might be converting to and if you've had what your process is for updating those assessments? Uh, well, the uh, standards of learning, uh, they apply through uh, from, from grades K through 12 uh, and they address sort of, sort of core subjects uh, English, math, science, uh, history or social uh, social science, uh, fine arts, uh, foreign language, even even health and physical education, uh, and driver education, and they basically they establish a baseline, and uh, uh, there are um, minimum expectations for what students are required to know uh, and be able to, to uh, you know, to test on by the end of each grade or course. And uh, again, we, we started in, in June of 1995, and, uh, and in 97 we established the standards of accreditation for public schools in Virginia. and. Uh, those link the statewide uh, accountability tests uh, standards of learning, so they hold students and schools and school divisions accountable for results. Is there any connection uh, to accreditation with those exams? Well, there is, and it kind of interestingly, uh, we just uh, we just passed law uh, during the last session that would establish an A through F uh, grading uh, score for each of our schools, each of our public schools. Um, that proved to be extremely unpopular. Uh, I think there's sort of a bipartisan consensus that if you rate a school uh, A through F and, and if a child happens to be in an F school, they're going to say, well, look, you know, mom or dad, um, can I be expected to, to study if my school is a failing school? And also there's, a, there's real concern that you're not going to get the best Teachers uh, who will be able to, uh, uh, you know, that you, you can attract them to schools that happen to to have very low ratings. So we're we're going to back off, and we're still developing this. But I think we'll abolish the A through F grading, and we we are still going to evaluate the the schools, but it will be at a more subtle. Uh, more subtle level so that uh, uh, we don't stigmatize the schools and yet at the same time we'll, we'll have adequate feedback to where we can we can you know, be aware when there are failing schools and we can we can do something to try to improve their their situation. Thank you. One of the interesting things, uh, about Virginia um, that I know I have always used as, as, a, as an example here in Idaho uh, when uh, people talk to me about uh, the Fed mandating uh, the, this adoption, which clearly wasn't the case 
uh, here in Idaho was that it was a, a condition of, of our race to the top application for, for which we, we did not succeed. We were not a uh, race to the top uh, grantee. Um, can you speak to Virginia and if they apply for race to the top money and and can you can you speak? You to know, that? I, I'm afraid I'm not real well informed on that. I, I don't know whether we're involved in that. Uh, it, it's not something that I'm personally familiar with. Um, our 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 testing in Virginia is not. It's not designed so much to, you know, where you where you win something by succeeding, but um, the you know the children know whether they have passed the standards of learning test personally, uh, and uh, and they have to pass the standards of learning test uh, in in order to graduate, um, and at the same time. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the school has to get a, a passing uh, grade. Uh, now, students are required to get 70 percent uh, to pass. Um, gives you a, a score of 400, and then a perfect score is a score of 600. Uh, but basically, it's just it's just sort of to determine whether you have whether you have succeeded or not. Mm -hmm. Was was the uh, the General Assembly there involved in in the original creation then of these Virginia standards of learning or revisions or is that handled by an agency? Well, the board the Board of Education uh, established various committees that uh, that drafted and developed the standards of learning. Uh, this, this was a very, very major undertaking for the state, uh, probably one of the most work-intensive pieces of, of, uh, of, of legislation and, and its outgrowth that we have ever uh, undertaken. Uh, and we, you know, we had, uh, we had a great deal of citizen involvement and so forth to make sure that we, you know, we hit all of the, the basic uh, requirements and, and we had consensus on uh, on uh, what were the uh, you know what were the uh, standards that we should use. Um, there's a, a National Governors Association Center for Best Practices uh, and a uh, council of chief state school officers, uh, and they they were very heavily involved in the development. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Done with the with the SOL testing. I, I think there may be some overlap with what uh, with what the Common Core, um, you know, sort of sort of the approach. But uh, the difference is that. Uh, we're doing it as a as a Virginia program rather than a federal uh, federal program. I, I think there you know there has been unease among among a great many grassroots people at the way that Common Core was developed, where basically you had uh, you know an extremely wealthy family that. Uh, that funded it to the tune of uh, almost a quarter of a billion dollars with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And, uh, I think that that made people very uneasy. I, I know that has been a, a concern in other states, the, the idea that uh, you would just have some individual who would decide that, uh, you know, he was going to, you know, sort of revolutionized the school system. I'm not sure that that has gone over well with uh, with legislators generally, um, regardless of the actual merits and, and outcomes of, of Common Core. Mm -hmm. That definitely uh, was a barrier here in Idaho as well. However, um, 
because we were able to demonstrate the, uh, the, the very public process that, that ours went through and that Idaho teachers had been involved in, and that we created a gap analysis between our previous standards and the core. And, and our uh, language standards were not that much different. The math standards uh, were significantly different, but uh, that definitely was a, a common concern uh, here in Idaho. Uh, Senator Stargell, could could you, um, as we're starting to wrap up here, could you just uh, speak a little bit about uh, some of the barriers that were in Florida with the the Common Core? I know significant amounts of professional development and teacher training were needed here in Idaho as we we made the conversion. Can you speak maybe about some of the the barriers that you had to uh, work through to uh, have a, a, a strong implementation? Well, we haven't fully, okay, as I said earlier, we haven't actually implemented the Common Core standards. We're continuing to implement the Florida standards, um, which have a lot of the different components of Common Core. But there is some training that's going to, that the teachers are um, experiencing with the new standards. And from uh, what I've heard from the educators on the field, they've not had any trouble with the new standards. Many of them have liked the way that some of the different training has come about, and many have, and I think that's sometimes the case with any kind of a change whenever we've changed the standards, whether we changed it to our uh, some of the next generation or, you know, as we've changed these to the Florida standards. So that, that happened. Um, and I will say on the previous uh, conversation, you were talking about the Race to the Top funds. Florida was a recipient of the Race to the Top uh, funds back in 2010. But we have made changes to the Common Core standards. We have the Florida standards. There's quite a few changes between the two. It's not exactly the same as the Common Core standards. Uh, we've implemented our standards. We have our assessment. Uh, it's not a nationally mandated um, assessment. Um, and it's not ma nationally mandated standards or even nationally mandated curriculum. So we have managed to maintain our autonomy. But we also did receive the Race to the Top funds. Um, so from that aspect of it, that, that part has, has, been, has gone well. We have had pushback for, since we've had um, assessments that have, have, um, had, that have basically mattered, kind of the previous conversation about the A through F, we do have an A through F grading system in the state of Florida. Um, I know I, as a parent, have appreciated that grading standard because I know how my child's school is performing. Instead of you move into a new area, people always say, well, what's the school like, or this or that, and there was all these uh, scales that no one really knew what they meant. So now we know what they mean. It's very clear if your school is an A or your school is an F. And students who went to F schools, um, you saw a lot of pressure from parents um, and everyone working together to try to make that school not be an F school. And then you saw teachers and the administration, everybody was on board. Nobody wanted to be an F school. We saw an incredible rise in our schools across the state of Florida. Um, each year they tend to go up until, like this last year, we changed the assessment, so they all dipped. But I, I anticipate the next few years they will rise back up again because they don't want to be those low-performing schools. So you have everybody working towards the same goal with a very clear goal in mind. And then when they get a result, they know exactly what that result means, um, that they got an A school. You see the schools that are A's are thrilled, and they will they buy flags and they advertise that and they're very proud of the sports they've gotten and the schools that did not get the A that were the F. They're, they're very, there are not very many of them across the state, which I'm proud to say. They're, they're becoming fewer and fewer and we're providing other options for those students who do attend those schools to go to a school that's providing some better, um, you know, for whatever reason, a school that seems to be performing better. So we haven't had, um, we've not, we're not, implementing fully Common Core, like what, like what you've discussed. So we haven't seen those theories. We are implementing our Florida standards. And that is, um, has the pushback it's had in the past, which people who do not like assessments and do not like that accountability. But I believe that if you don't measure, you don't care. And I believe that we should measure to know exactly how we're doing. Indeed. Of what value are the standards if you can't assess uh, against them? Thank you. Uh, any final comments you would like to offer, Senator Stargell? No, I just think this has been a very good discussion to see the different viewpoints um, from the different states. I think for policymakers, it's always beneficial to learn from each other so we don't um, have to continue to reinvent the wheel and we can benefit from each other's successes and failures. So that's why I appreciate these types of uh, webinars and, and what Alec does in providing that, that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Black, any, any final thoughts that you would like to share? Yeah, um, I just uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to participate in this. I think it's interesting to see uh, this this struggle that we're going through to try to uh, uh, to develop uh, standards for schools. I think um, interesting. I think if you, if you go back twenty or thirty years, we we really did not have these problems and. Uh, I have some concern myself that some of the attempts to modernize certain of the of the practices, for example, mathematics. Um, mathematics used to be a very straightforward. I've seen some of the attempts to revise and, and modernize, and uh, and it makes it so theoretical that uh, often uh, often children have great difficulty. Uh, becoming very proficient in mathematics, so uh, we, I'm not sure that that uh, testing is the be all and end all. I think to some extent uh, uh, there there are things that should be done, and I, I personally I I like the idea of the of the 50 states being individual laboratories uh, to perhaps discover new and better ways, but uh, it's it, there certainly are two sides to the to the issue, and I, I appreciate uh, listening to the other sides also. Thank you, Senator, and thank you to both of you for taking some time late on a Friday afternoon to participate in this webinar. And with that, Lindsay, I think back to you. Yeah, thank you. I would just like to again thank you, Senator Stargell from Florida and Senator Black from. Virginia. I'd also like to um, thank Representative Horman from Idaho for doing a great job at moderating. Um, I appreciate the, the content of the conversation, and I think this is excellent discourse. Um, just as a reminder, our future webinar is Wednesday, January 21st at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I will be sending around that call in information just as today. Um, these uh, webinars are recorded and will be archived and available for you um, after our third webinar on Wednesday. Um, if you have any further questions or if there's anything else I can do for you, um, please feel free to email me at lrussell at alec.org. Thank that, you very much. Yep, thank, thank you. you.